All right, I see there's quite a few people um, joining us today, which is great to see. Um, some old students, Lincoln, I see, and Albi, welcome, Cameron, and um, some people from the conference, Cindy, hey, John, well, nice to see you. Bonnie, it's always great to have you online. Etienne, okay, great. I think um, everyone that was waiting is now is now in. So um, with that, we will we will start. Um, so um, Nicolette, Dr. Le Nicolette from Arc is the the speaker today, and she's going to be talking on monitoring, an important component in water resources management. And um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Nicolette. Uh, she worked at the department for many, many years um, and is very experienced with monitoring and wor has worked on a number of different projects. She um, finished her PhD a couple years ago and is now at the Center for Environmental Management here at the uh, University of the Free State, um, busy with her postdoc. Nicolette has been very involved with the groundwater division and also with the um, Danida um, Danish um, Groundwater Institute <laughs> and um, has done projects there and she's uh, an alumni and also runs this African alumni um, group yeah, in South Africa. All right, so uh, Nicolette, let me know that she's having some problems with her video. So she won't be, you won't be able to see her, um, but um, I'll be here afterwards to, to take questions and to facilitate the discussion. But with that, I will hand over to Nicolette. Nicolette, I, I can't hear you. I haven't spoken yet, Amy. Oh. Sorry, um, I'm just trying okay. to um, share my um, presentation. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you will um, find this talk interesting. It's based on my almost 13 years, well, 12 years experience at the department and a little bit of what I am um, experienced afterwards. Now, some years back, I wrote an article for the water wheel because in the department, they were busy closing down rain gauges. And I felt that it is um, not a very good idea to do that. And since then I've learned that um, our monitoring in South Africa has declined rapidly, whether it's weather is, uh, South African weather services or the department or um, wherever. So our knowledge of our water resources is declining. So what we're going to talk about, and as you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen, I, I'm going to have a number of photographs. And some places I'll stop and explain the photographs because there's sometimes a story behind it. But this is basically the contents of the talk today. Um, we're going to first look at what is monitoring, why we do we need to do monitoring, the types of monitoring that you get, um, and that with that I don't mean service water, groundwater, whatever, or um, quality uh, and quantity, but that's because that's part of it. But there's um, a, a different distinction linked to it. What do we need, need to monitor? How to do the monitoring? That, that's going to be our biggest section. When to do the monitoring, meaning your time intervals, and who's responsible for the monitoring. And I must be honest for developing that concept in my head and where to do the monitoring. And we're going to end up with developing a monitoring network. I am planning a follow-up session, whether it's going to be just one webinar or a workshop on what to do with the monitoring data once you've got it. So um, that will um, follow um, in due course, but this is basically what gonna, we're going to talk about. The photograph on the top is one of my friends and ex-colleagues. That, um, that's busy taking a sample from a, a cumulative rain gauge that the department used um, and it was developed in the department um, so that we could test it for isotopes. And the photograph at the bottom was taken of the Burke River Dam in 2011. And as you can see, the water level was quite low, not quite as low as in 2017, 
But um, this was also one of the drought cycles that we went through in the Western Cape. So what is monitoring? Now, monitoring is part of everyday life, whether you're in the medical field or the economics field or whichever field you are, because it's used to observe and check the progress or quality of something over a period of time and keep it under systematic review. One of the reasons for monitoring is to see whether there's changes and, um, so that you can make interventions. So if a, a price rises or um, something like that, you need to have uh, an idea of what's happening. Um, it also involves the collecting and analyzing of data to identify patterns, trends, and anomalies, and to detect any deviations. And it's often done against the standard. And the photograph at the bottom is the one that I think most of us don't like. It's when our boss monitors our work because it feels like they don't trust you. And I must tell you, I don't function very well in circumstances like that. But um, it's all part of monitoring and the different kinds of monitoring that we experience in life. Um, so why do we need to do monitoring? And I'm going to give you some reasons. There might be more, but this is the ones I could come up with. One of the first is we need to find out if the water resources is available. And I'm just um, disclaimer, I'm going to talk a little bit about surface water and rainfall as well. Um, just to make it all inclusive, but the concentration will be on groundwater. Um, so we need to know whether there's water available. And if you look at the gauge uh, plate on the top of that photograph, um, there's some places in South Africa that's been struggling with very low measurements for a very long time. And we were fortunate to have some good rainfall the last couple of years. So we also need to know the quality of the water. And it uh, depends. The quality depends on the uses that we can make of it. So there's different uses for the different um, levels of uh, allowable chemical variation. And the Department of Water and Sanitation many years back brought out a number of guidelines on what is acceptable for agriculture, for domestic use, for... for um, uh, recreational use and uh, uh, various other uses. And you'll find that even in industry, um, the, uh, the quality requirements vary. I know one of the biggest complaints for some of the um, in, uh, industries in Saldana Bay, for example, was that the water quality wasn't suitable for them um, in their processes. And it has to do with the fact that um, Saldana Bay municipality got the water from the lower part of the Burke River after it's been through a number of wastewater treatment works and the inputs of agricultural runoff. Um, so it's very important to have the right quality of water. And I, even in, in agriculture, some of your vegetation don't like um, high, high salinity water. So even there, you have to have certain qualities. Some of the farmers we interacted with in the Franschhoek area that exports their um, products says that they have to comply to certain standards of their irrigation water before they can export to Europe. Um, we also do monitoring to measure the impact of activities, whether it is groundwater abstraction, abstraction out of rivers and, and dams, um, whether it's um, pollution incidents, and there your quality comes into play again. Also for planning, we need to know how much water we have so that we can see how much we need to fulfill the demands. And that fits in with the next point that says, we need to know the water use so that we can balance the supply and demand. And, um, if you talk to people like Farnes in the department that works a lot with planning, he'll show you for, uh, graphs where, um, in most cases, our uh, 
um, demand exceeds or at least um, balances with our supply, which means that we're going to run into problems in, uh, soon that is not just related to infrastructure and lack of management. Um, one of the most famous sayings around monitoring has to do with you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So for water resource management to be done properly, you need to know how much you have. And it comes into play with all of the uh, points above. Um, so we have different types of monitoring. The first one is baseline monitoring. And you'll find that before most big impacts, um, like the building of the Burke River Dam, and um, even in some cases, we request mines and uh, crude oil storage tanks and things like that when we, I was in the department, require them to do some baseline monitoring so that you have an idea that if something goes wrong, what it was like in the past and um, you can compare it with the baseline monitoring. Um, I read one report of an um, industry that says, um, compared to the previous year or the previous two years, we're not much worse than before. Um, they had no baseline uh, data to compare it to, so they had to compare it to previous data, um, which doesn't give you a very good indication of the impact that they're having on the environment. Then you have background monitoring. This is has to do with where you already have an impact, but you need to understand what the impact of that activity is on the uh, water in the natural situations or other water users. And then of course, you've got your impact monitoring. In groundwater, it has a lot to do with abstraction and pollution. In one case, we had a guy that um, wanted to um, start an agricultural um, in industry, whether it was raising of rabbits or um, planting potatoes or whatever, but his borehole in a alluvial aquifer was about 100 meters away from his neighbor's borehole. So that's the kind of things you always need to take into consideration. And then, of course, you need to monitor your water quality and your quantity. So um, the two photographs on the left and right hand side has to do with um, monitoring uh, water sampling with a baler um, for groundwater that you can't see. And my current boss that's now becoming the dean of um, the Faculty of Natural Sciences and Agriculture always teases us when we're in the field that um, why should we um, work with water that you can't see. So I included the photograph on the other side, which is the confluence of the Burke River and the Franschhoek River, and you can see a very clear color difference. Um, most of the time when with the recent sampling and uh, I did, our ground, our groundwater actually came out clearer than the surface water. So. That's just an indication of how you can sometimes see that there's something wrong with your water. And just interest uh, for interest sake, at the time I took that photograph, the Franschhoek wastewater treatment works didn't work. And um, that's part of the reason for that coloring. Um, what do we monitor? So this is basically a list of things to monitor or and some of the instruments to do it with. For water quantity, um, in surface water, we use gauge plates and weirs. Um, that level difference is then translated into a flow volume, except if you have a flow meter that's linked to the system. Um, groundwater, we often measure the water level um, and we use the gradient to determine the flow direction. Determining the, the fl flow um, speed of groundwater takes a bit more 
than this, and I'm, I haven't included it in this presentation. Rainfall, most of us are aware of this cone-shaped um, rain gauge that you can get for fairly cheap in, in a, a number of shops. But um, I've included the ones used by the department. And then you've got the tipping uh, bucket type system that um, also takes your um, re uh, recording automatically. But with that one, you can't take a sample like you can with the cumulative rain gauges from the department. And then, of course, abstraction volumes you can measure with um, flow meters that's in your pipeline. For water quality, we use water samples. And when, after you've taken that sample, you're supposed to take your field readings, which includes your pH, your temperature, and your EC or TDS, if you um, prefer TDS. I know in surface water, they prefer TDS. Um, and they are interchangeable with a conversion factor, but it's not always accurate because that conversion factor um, does not take into account that your salt content, your um, uh, is um, elements can differ. And that actually has an effect on that conversion, whether it's accurate or not. Then for chemical analysis, you have to send that sample to a lab and your macro elements is mostly those used in the plotting of piper diagrams and other similar plots. And I've listed them there, sodium, potassium, mag magnesium, calcium, and a few other, and then your an uh, anions. And your trace elements is actually quite a long list. I've only listed a few of them. And then, of course, you can also do your isotope analysis. And then I've put an interesting one there, um, and that's electricity use. One of the reasons why it's sometimes advisable to check your electricity use of uh, abstraction uh, for, for the pump that you use for abstraction, whether it's surface water or groundwater is, it tells you something about the pump efficiency and whether the pump actually needs to go in for maintenance. Because if there's clogging uh, or salt buildup on your pump, your pump is going to have to work harder to get the same volume of water at, um, into your tanks or wherever you're pumping to. Um, so together with electricity use, you can also um, add your um, pump volume. And... Um, I've included some photographs there for some of you that don't know yet. The top instrument there is called the Orphimides. It was one of the, in my opinion, best um, data loggers from Ott. It's a German company. Um, and it worked on a very simple uh, principle. Um, but unfortunately, they're out of production. And then of, uh, on the other two photographs, it's the sampling pump that we used for uh, when I was at the department. Um, the, uh, the first one is when uh, after we put it on a very new um, engineered, developed or um, designed um, reel. So how to do monitoring. And as I said, this is going to be the longest section. For water quantity, so I'm going to basically take the list that I gave you before, and I'm going to break it down a little bit. For water quantity, we often use gauge plates and weirs, and then flow meters. Now, the photograph on the top right is the weir at um, Rosher Pan. Um, it was measuring the flow through the um, Popkos River into the pan. And just some background on the pan, it's actually a man-made coastal wetland. Um, the original owner of the property, Mr. Rosher, decided he needs more... Um, uh, place for his cattle to graze, so we diverted the river from its uh, 
original flow into the sea into the uh, to behind the dunes so that um, he could create the wetland type to set up for for his um cattle to have more grazing and as you can see at that stage this weir was completely dry there was no water in it but it was still equipped with an old art recorder i will show you a photograph of the art recorder on uh, the inside of it in a, a follow-up photograph the second photograph is at Zachariasuk. Zachariasuk was part of the mountain catchment studies that was started in 1964. And as you can see, there's your uh, V notch weir. Um, and just in front of it, you have a gauge plate, and you have another gauge plate on the other side of the weir. But it was also equipped with um, Talimiris instruments from Ott. There was two of them in that um, little house at the top of the stairs, so that you have a backup in case the one uh, stops working. Um, and it would take the water level, which, as I said, would be converted to flow. For groundwater, you have measured your um, water level with a dip meter because you can't see underneath the ground. Now, a dip meter basically works on the fact that the salt content of your water will conduct electricity. Um, and the, if you your instrument then touches the water, it will close a broken um, circuit and it will give you uh, an indication that there is, um, if you reach the water table. Now the two sketches on here comes from the Nora toolkit, and it shows you how you should take the water level. So, from most of the time, we preferred these old-fashioned dip meters that worked with an ammeter. So the moment the needle deflects on that ammeter. You um, know you're in the water and you take the reading with your finger right at the edge of the borehole casing or in the case of the photograph on the top um, right hand side, you take it at the level the, uh, the closest that you can get to the, um, uh, on this, um, I think in this case, it's going, going to be on your concrete block. There are cases where the water table is so high that you can use a, a measuring tape. And I know from the many field books I worked through for the study that did in Zacharia Souk, they used the measuring tape with um, chalk on it. I'm not sure how it worked, but the wetting of the chalk actually gave you an indication of the water uh, table. And um, the field book actually indicated that in some cases the water table was too deep for the measuring tape to work. So just something interesting on groundwater levels. Um, and the, as I said before, it gives you a gradient and the gradient is then used to determine your flow direction. Um, this is some of the data loggers that you can use to measure your water tape uh, table electronically and you can set the interval on which the um, readings will take place. Um, I'm going to start on the left hand side. Most of you know the Solens level loggers. This one, um, we did sampling at the borehole and we came back about a month later and we found the borehole outside the um, the the data logger outside the borehole because we forgot to replace it. At least it was still there. But we had some um, very bad data for a whole month. Um, the one right at the top uh, in the right hand side is the inside of that odd um, data recorder. So you would have a graph running on that cylinder and a pen um, recording the changes in the water table, but um, you had to go there 
every so often to change that um, graph paper. And then someone would sit in the Department of Water and Sanitation and digitize that data so that it could be captured on the databases. And you will find that um, you have very strange uh, time intervals for that time period. The next one is that little steel box. It was, we used it in two sites in the uh, Burke River um, area. Um, and I can't remember if it's got a specific name, but um, almost every time we went to download it, Henry, my colleague that I had at that stage, would have to phone Bill Buenzar and say, Bill, please tell me how to do it again. Because it was a very interesting, uh, in intricate downloading process. Um, the two photographs at the bottom right, as uh, we used uh, the odd um, instrument to download the data uh, loggers, and the first, the one is the Orphemeris that I already showed you, and the next one is um, the Orpheus Mini. Um, we did something with, with the Orpheus Mini when we installed it that you're actually not supposed to do. Sometimes we use the um, data logger with long cables and we um, wrapped it a, a little bit to make it fit into our borals. But this one was still not installed and you can actually see it was quite a long um, instrument. This is our rain gauges except for the one on the top right, that is a weather station that was on top of the mountain above Aurora. Um, the department put up a couple of them in the Sandfeld area, um, and some of them got destroyed by fires. This one was still standing there, but it wasn't working anymore. Um, the other two photographs, has to do with um, our cumulative rain gauges, and it also worked with the telemeters like um, they use in the weir. So here you can see the telemeters as an um, instrument that's re doing the recording, and it has a um, rope running over a pulley system, and on the other side into the uh, cylinder the, uh, the where the rainfall is collected, you have a floater. And this floater and the movement across the pulley would give the reading to the instrument. And you'll see uh, um, Henry using the odd instrument to download the data from that telemedis. Um, this instrument worked with infrared, so there was little eyes in those, uh, the um, Orpheus Mini, the telemedis, and the Orpheus and you had to have the reader over those eyes so that they could communicate. This is to give you an indication of the volume abstracted. And, um, you've got different kinds of um, meters. So it's installed inside the, the pipe um, just above the borehole, and it will give you the reading of the flow most of the time in cubic meters, sometimes it's in cubic meters times 10. So you have to make sure that you um, read it properly, otherwise you're going to get the wrong um, reading. Some of them will give you a, a full reading in the um, running numbers, and others you have to include the little dials to give you your um, numbers below um, zero. This is water qu uh, quality. Um, and I must um, just tell you, most of these photographs were taken by me. But some of them I have to give credit to my colleague and friend Kezia Smith. Um, because the one on the left hand side is me with the EC meter. This is a XTEC DO700. So she took these. Most of them, um, you won't see me in the photograph. Um, but I had to include this to show you I, uh, I was there. Um, so as I said before, with your when you're doing your sampling, 
you can do uh, take the sample in a number of ways. It's uh, either if you have um, a um, portal that's already connected to a uh, system where you can just use a tap, like in the photograph in the top right, you can take a grab sample like Henry is doing in the bottom center from a, a this is a V notch in um, that was part of the uh, work that Umvota had done in Citrus Dal area. So it's a grab sample. And then um, we have already showed you a photograph of a baler and then a pump. But it's very in, important to do it as clean as possible um, so that you don't have any contamination in the process. Um, just for interest sake, in the photograph in the top right, um, in the, at the department, you, we used different bottles. The um, transparent one had a blue lid. That was your macro uh, elements, while the one in the red was the trace elements. But somehow, when it gets analyzed, people still got confused, and they would analyze both for, the, uh, for other macros or for um, trace elements. So we had to start labeling them to have different times just to differentiate them on another level as well. Um, field readings is very important because it gives you the in, in situ uh, or as close to in situ data. Um, and as mentioned before, the most common ones is pH, EC or TDS and then temperature. Um, most of these readings are temperature dependent, so it's that that's why it's important to include your temperature. And then this XTO700 could also do a, a range of other um, readings like resistivity, um, salinity. It also measures TDS. So when you select your um, instrument for doing field readings, Go and look at the range of measurements that it can take and the different para uh, parameters it can uh, read. Um, when I had to choose an uh, instrument for this at the department, I looked at three different instruments. And this one was actually came out the best, even though it might not have been the cheapest at the time, because it can measure an easy range of almost zero to over 22,000 millisiemens per centimeter, per meter. So keep that in mind when you select an instrument. And then I uh, already mentioned the different um, chemical elements that you need to uh, or can analyze for. Of course, if there is a pollution incident, like in hydrocarbons or whatever, that will be included in your analysis. How to... Uh, once you've done the uh, monitoring, what? how do you record it? It's important to write down, write down your date and time. The reason for the date is clear because uh, water levels can change over time. But the time is also important, especially if you're doing your monitoring near a well field or an abstraction borehole, because there is more rapid changes in the water levels when there is as abstraction taking place. Um, so it is important to keep that time recorded. Then the readings you can uh, record is water levels, your gauge plate readings, or, or your, your weirs. And in your weirs, you have um, have to take the um, in your V-notch the height of the water flow above the bottom of the uh, V-notch. And then you have a conversion table that will tell you the flow volume. Um, rain gauge readings, um, with those cumulative rain gauge, we had a measuring tape on the side of the um, tube that we, tell, uh, that we would use to um, double check whether the instrument is reading correctly. Um, then, of course, your uh, meter readings and your field readings you need to record. Your data record you need to keep either in a field book or a field sheet. 
the best would be to have both. So you have the field book that you take to the field and do your recording and then transfer it to a field sheet. One of the reasons why I prefer the field book is if your field, uh, if it rains and your field book gets wet, the damage is not quite as bad as when your field sheet gets wet and it may destroy your complete record. I also do my recording in pencil because uh, it doesn't smudge as badly as ink. But if your page get very wet, it's still difficult to write and then read afterwards. It starts becoming an embossed um, reading more than anything else. Um, when you take samples, mark it properly with the site name, the date, and the time. And it should correspond with the field sheet or your field book. The latest I um, tip that I got from uh, Janine at the Biogrip Lab in Stellenbosch is to repeat that sample site name onto the lid of your bottle. Um, because if the sites get smudged, you at least have it at the lid as well. When I was at the department, we didn't write on the bottle itself. We used masking tape around it, and that prevented it from smudging too badly. And it's something I actually neglected the last couple of times that I did monitoring. Once you've taken your sample, keep it in a cooler box. Um, in some cases, when I was at the, depart at the department, we, we used mercury chloride to fix the uh, sample so that there's no more chemical and um, changes taking place. But once you've done that, you actually mess up your chloride um, readings and you then can't use that data for um, recharge estimations. So please keep that in mind. The best is keep it in the cool box and get it to the lab as quickly as possible. Then observations is important and you should record it which also, in my opinion, makes a, a field book um, better than a field sheet because you have more space to write. This includes things like new developments, changing in uh, land use, whether there was fire in the area. And I've actually found that um, fire do show an uh, impact on the groundwater levels in certain areas, especially where you have high water table in any case. Vegetation removal is another thing that may have an impact on your water level um, measurements. And then photographs, like the ones on the right hand side. Um, I was sitting in class my first time at IGS and Prof. Gerard van Tonder was telling us about piezometers and one of my classmates says, but we don't use piezometers in South Africa. There was some crazy Belgians that um, installed piezometers in South Africa. Um, I know there's drawbacks to piezometers. Um, most often the fact that um, your accuracy um, is not quite the same and you have um, collapsing um, piezometers. But these were done in 1984 and 85 and they're actually still quite functional. The um, piezometer of this this series that collapse was most often the top part of the aquifer. This um, borehole is called G triple three two zero, and it's between the Elmsfontein and the Langebaan Road paleo channels. Um, the second photograph there with the bucket in is us getting stuck on the um, one of the beach roads um, on the Cape Flats. It was a very windy time just before we went there and the dune decided to creep over the tar road. Um, one of the good things that happened, we passed someone that was already stuck and their insurance sent out someone with a truck to come and pick them up. So. Um, when we passed them and got stuck there to remove us before they could get to their client. So that's sometimes things that tell you about environmental changes and things that um, you may not have recorded in other ways than 
with the photograph. The photograph of the yellow borel on top of the mountain is one of the highest borels we monitored um, when I was at the department. This one is BG45. Sorry, I think I've got the wrong number wrong. I think it's uh, 91. The water table of this borel is usually at about 45 meters below color. Um, it's on the Franschhoek Pass, and you can overlook the whole Berg River Valley from that borel, as you can see in that photograph. The other photograph, the last one on this page, is the very first time I went to do groundwater monitoring. I think it was the 9th of October, 2008. It was a rainy, drizzly uh, day in Cape Town, cold and um, miserable, and we had to take a sample of this uh, borel. Can't remember the name now. Um, it's on the farm Goederist. And I was standing inside that little pump house there with a broken door. And my colleague tried to take the sample in, in the pipes outside and something broke and um, it sprayed water in, into that pump house and I got even more drenched than I had been originally. And this was my, when I decided I want to continue with groundwater. So take your photographs. They often tell you a story and remind you of what happened at the site. When to do monitoring. This has to do with your time intervals. The ideal that most of us would like to have is continuous, or at least hourly or whatever. But it often gives you extremely big data sets that makes it difficult to analyze. And I know Excel does not analyze logger data. It is just too much for it to handle. When it comes, and you can't always install data loggers to get your more continuous data. Um, and this economic reality issue, it's first of all the cost of the data logger. And if you want to do it more regularly, regularly especially for a monitoring um, area that's, clo uh, that's not close to base, um, it becomes expensive to travel. Um, Weekly gives you an extremely good data set, and that is the monitoring data set that I had for Zacharia Souk. Um, Eric Prinsler from the CSR told me that the guy that did the monitoring there was very conscientious. He would uh, take one day each week for Zacharia Souk, another day for um, uh, uh, Yonkersuk and another day for the other site that I and just now forgot the name for. But it was these three uh, monitoring uh, routes that he did. And he did them every week, whether it was Christmas or New Year's or Easter or whatever the public holiday was, he would go and do it. Most of the time you'll find that he would go from around, according to the timesheets, the field books, from around five, as soon as the light was up to six, and then he's done for the day, and then he could go and spend time with his family. And that time interval actually gave very good um, graphs, and you could use it to get very good statistical analysis. Yakos Refir was the other side. Um, the problem is, once again, your economic realities, especially if it's um, sites far from your base. Um, so you, you need to consider all things when you d decide on your time intervals. When I started doing the monitoring in the West Coast in 2009, our time interval for monitoring in the West Coast, the Saldana area was monthly. Monthly also gives you very good um, data and you can you uh, do very good statistical analysis with it. Um, but once again, it's one of the first things that um, 
gets cut when um, budgets are um, no longer big enough. And we had to move from monthly monitoring to quarterly monitoring. Quarterly monitoring would then give you um, one reading per season, which actually still works out quite good. And it could at least be used for um, seeing what the water levels are doing in each season. And um, this was still acceptable. One of our other um, monitoring routes, the Berg Baseline Monitoring Route, we only did three times a year when I started it. We changed the quarterly later. And that three times a year actually didn't quite give you the seasonal um, variation that you wanted to see. There was something missing in those graphs. I am not sure what time interval my old office is using, but for me, the minimum is at least twice a year, the end of the wet season and the end of the dry season, so that you can see that level of fluctuation. Unfortunately, this does not give you a very nice data spread and your data analysis and statistics and things becomes a bit messed up. So um, this is just some in information on your time intervals. All of this depends on what you need the data for, what you want to do with it. If it's just to get a basic idea of what's going on, twice a year would be fine. If it's for compliance and they said you have to do monitoring but they didn't specify the time, twice a year would probably be fine. But if you really want to know what's going on, please look for a, a more frequent time interval. Um, just about the photographs, the one at the bottom is two of my colleagues, one of them, both of them still at the department. We, they're doing um, something with that new bolt pump from us, of us in the Roberts Flay Valley. Um, it's no longer that new the pump, it's had a few hiccups, but it's, I hope it's still working. And the photograph at the top is one of my students doing, um, uh, taking field readings at the um, Whitland on the farm Brakfontein in, in the Saldana area. So who is responsible for monitoring? Whose job is it to make sure that we know what's going on with our um, water resources? Now, according to the National Water Act, the Department of Water and Sanitation is responsible for it because they're the custodian of water or um, the, the minister is and they have to do what the minister has to do, something like that. And the ideal year is what um, Farnes taught me when I was still at the department. Um, because I had a very big fight on letting the monitoring go. Um, my supervisor wanted me to be more in the office and I said, I cannot let the monitoring go unless I have someone reliable that can take over from me. Um, and uh, I had this big fight in my head, um, partly because I had some experiences with colleagues that came back from monitoring and you couldn't use the data at all, which meant that the time spent in the field was wasted. Um, now, the ideal is that the municipalities, for example, if they have um, a well field, they have to do at least 60 juice sites. Now, juice site includes your dug wells, rain gauges, and everything else that's related to um, groundwater monitoring. Um, so, for example, they have to do their um, five uh, production wells, then uh, monitoring wells around it, and a number of boreholes close by. Um, especially for people that can potentially be impacted. Your catchment management agency or your protox CMA then has to do a smaller number of the monitoring um, at a, 
um, they can do it at a lower frequency than the municipality has to do. But they have to have some idea of what's going on in the field themselves, kind of as a quality check or audit requirement. And the Depart Department of Water and Sanitation will then, to fulfill their function of auditing and, and checking what's going on, for example, monitoring five to two juice sites and maybe twice a year and not quite as frequent. Now, other people that need to be uh, do, do monitoring is mines to see if they have an impact, whether it is from dewatering or uh, potential um, pollution um, from their activities, agriculture. Um, and I'm, uh, this has not been a very strong thing, except with new license um, conditions. But I know with the drought from in the Western Cape from 2015 to 2018, um, it was gazetted that metering is now compulsory for groundwater abstraction. Surface water abstraction was compulsory before then because of the fact that the Burke River was a surface water control area. Um, so still water level um, uh, recordings doesn't need to do, uh, be done, but you have to do your metering. Um, then industry, and um, I know a lot of um, companies put in their own groundwater systems during the drought in the Western Cape. So um, I think most of them had to apply for um, water use licenses. So industry also needs to make sure that their activities does not impact the groundwater. And then, of course, if you've, you're a water user and you've got a water use license, you have to do monitoring if it is in your conditions. The GAs to me was a very, uh, general authorizations was very difficult because I would have liked to uh, uh, request monitoring to be done, but they told me, sorry, I cannot set conditions. So um, general authorizations, the department needs to sort it out for, for future reference. Um, just to give an indication of two sites, um, at the top right, you've got a dug well. This one was to the south of the of Ellingsfontein. We called it G42, I oh know, 342 slash 2, because there was another um, Jew site on this property that got the number one. The second one is um, one of the strangest piezometers that I encountered um, during the monitoring I did there, but it was because. Um, the borals in this area tended to be artesian, so they had to include that possibility when they set up this piezometer. Um, the one at the top that's kind of on the edge of the photograph was cut off. So at one stage, the, the numbering of the piezometers got confused, and I had to go and sort out a lot of data to try and get them back together to, to, to match it up with the right data records. And the photograph at the bottom was taken by um, my current boss, Paul Oberholzer. We were on our way to install a piezometer on the edge of this wetland on Brackfontein. And we have another photograph of my student next to me there. Um, just to continue on the theme of who's responsible for monitoring, if you have a borehole or a dug well, please take the time to monitor your own um, drill site. It will provide you information on the behavior of the groundwater, and you can then see the response to uh, rainfall or abstraction. Um, you can also see if someone close by to you um, is abstracting because you're gonna see it in your water levels. Um, you can also see the impact of pollution incidents, and there's quite a number of examples across the country where um, people close to filling stations suddenly found um, clean um, petrol in their borehole. So um, it is important to do that. And it's also for your own protection. 
if you cannot tell someone that my neighbor is now abstracting and is affecting my um, water table in my borehole, so I'm uh, I lost the pump because the water table went below it and the pump burnt out or whatever, you're gonna gonna have no foot to stand on if you have no data. Um, also, we were doing a hydro census in um, Justenberg Flakte, just north of the N1, linked to a pollution incident. And we took a water level reading at this one borehole, and we got, I think it was something like 38 meters. And the um, owner said, oh, no, my pump is not much deeper than that. So even if it's just to check that you don't um, over abstract your own borrow, it's important to do the monitoring. Um, just once again, coming back to why photographs are important. Um, the photograph on the top right is from BG95 in the Zaharia Souk Valley. And it was shortly after um, a very bad felt fire in January 2013. Um, and um, this is an indication of what happens after such a big fire. And it's interesting that just a week before that fire, we went to do monitoring there. And I said to my colleague, this area hasn't burned for a very long time. The vegetation is getting too mature. If a fire comes through now, it's going to burn hot and fast. And a week later, the fire came through. And this valley looked like a desert after that fire. Um, here you can see some of the vegetation slowly recovering. Then, and the photograph in the middle is Eddie van Wijk with some of these rain gauges in the Beaufort West area. Um, there's two rain gauges there for a purpose. The first one at the back is the one to give you clean water so you can use it for chemical analysis. And the one in front has antifreeze in it so that you can at least get the rainfall um, volume uh, without it freezing during the winter time. Um, and the other um, photograph, the last photograph here is to show you guys what was my job when um, we went uh, sampling in the West Coast? I had to pull up the pump. And some of the uh, boreholes, we um, lowered the pump to 80 meters. Um, and yes, uh, shortly before I left the department, I went to the field with some students. And we got to one of these 80 meter boreholes. And um, I offered to pull up the pump. and it's, let us know if you get tired, because they apparently changed in between pulling up the pump and I pulled up the whole uh, 80 meters. And I must tell you, even if it's a small pump with 80 meters of water, it, the pump gets very heavy. So where to do monitoring? Um, production boroughs, and at, especially at well fields, it's very important to do monitoring. Um, monitoring boreholes, especially those linked to your production boreholes, but it would be advisable to do it um, in uh, other boreholes to get your background information and if you've got your own boreholes so that you know what's going on. If there was a pollution impact, you need to monitor the juice sites close by. Um, if there's a potential for saline or brackish water intrusion, this is especially true and near coastal areas, and if there's brackish groundwater nearby. Um, I know in some places you get um, actually a quite good um, quality uh, aquifer right next to a saline aquifer. And if you um, have your own borehole, as I said, you need to monitor your own groundwater. Um, at the top is just a photograph again to show exactly how to, uh, where to take your um, measurement for um, water levels. And the one at the top gives you an indication of um, water that's been standing in a uh, borehole for some time and it's 
started to getting uh, the rust color. If you um, let it pump for a little while, the color some uh, most of the time disappears. Um, the last point is developing a monitoring network. Um, I I'm not going into all the theory. I'm just giving you a basic idea of um, how to develop it or why you need to develop it. So develop, reasons for developing a monitoring network is of, as often to do with abstraction pollution and to gain a scientific understanding. Um, this last one can be a bit problematic because sometimes you think that you now understand what's going on and you stop the monitoring and then um, there's a well-field development, there's a mine development, there's a whatever that can change the um, impacts. And then 10 years later, you get there and um, suddenly the picture looks completely different. And I've seen it happen in data records. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm not very keen on, on people starting a project, putting up infrastructure like boroughs and things. And then when the project funding runs out, um, they stop um, the monitoring. Long-term monitoring is one of the best ways to see how things change over time and it will feed into um, water resource planning. Accessibility is one of the big problems. There was times when we did monitoring um, where the farmer suddenly decided he's going to move the gate and you get to the route that you normally took and suddenly you can't get through it anymore or there's a gate locked, or uh, there's a new owner and he doesn't like to have you there and he put his, uh, would put his dogs on you or um, even come out with a gun um, or whatever the case may be. Site selection is a very important thing when developing um, a monitoring network. You have to see whether it's gonna monitor what you want, it, want to see. So if you... Um, for example, uh, I have a border on one side of a dike and um, you develop your whole, whole monitor, and that's the production border, and you develop your whole monitoring network on the other side of the dike, you're not gonna get the information that you need. So you need to be careful on your site selection. Then your par parameter selection, um, are you only gonna measure water levels to see the response to rainfall? or abstraction or whatever the case may be, or are you gonna do um, chemical analysis to see if there's changes in the chemistry? Um, the reason why you have to look at uh, this is, it's gonna affect the um, cost implications for a monitoring network. And it's one of the things I didn't even add on this slide. Cost implications is an extremely important um, consideration when developing a monitoring network. And this includes your time intervals um, and um, how many people will do the monitoring and things like that. Unfortunately, in our current situation in South Africa, I know there's still people that do monitoring on their own. It's actually not very safe, even with two people. But you, at the moment you have more than two people doing monitoring, um, you're actually slowing the things down and it means that you can't work as effectively. Um, the, uh, my colleague, Henry and I would do monitoring um, sometimes from early morning before seven till um, in the summertime till about seven. And um, some of our colleagues thought we were superhuman, but um, if you have to do the work, try and do it in the shortest time period possible. And then of course you have to decide, is my monitoring network gonna include surface water, groundwater and precipitation or um, which part of the cycle are you gonna, uh, hydrological cycle are you gonna focus on? Um, and that is basically the end of my story for today. I'm going to end up leaving you with a couple of very nice resources that are available online. The NORA toolkit was developed through um, international cooperation. 
and it is available on the uh, website of the Department of Water and Sanitation. I've given you uh, the link here. Then there's the, uh, a little booklet called Field Hydrogeology by Rick Brashington. Um, the 2007 version is free online. There is a newer version, but um, you're going to uh, have to pay for that. And then on the WRC website, and there's a few other places where you can find it, is the groundwater sampling um, booklet done by John Weaver, Lisa Kave, and Sitoma. Um, it is, I think, in its second edition. So this is where I'm going to leave you. Thank you very much for attending. Any questions, you're welcome to ask them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicolette. That was amazing. <clears throat> Very informative. I enjoyed the stories. Um, yeah, so please, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Um, Cindy's clapping. Um, or you can write it in the chat box. We're also going to launch a poll now. Um, so if you would please complete the survey. It's a new thing if um, for the CPD points that, that needs to be um, done. So it should be popping up on your screen now. So go feel free to um, fill in that. And then also, if you haven't already filled in your name and association institute, um, please. Yeah, we need that for the attendance register so you can get your CBD points. All right. Um, any questions? Um, I don't see anything in the chat box for now. I don't see anyone's hands up. Nicolette, I maybe have a question for you while everyone's doing the poll or thinking about a question. Um, seeing that you've left the department now and, and in retrospect with the, the fact that, you know, the monitoring sites and the number of, of um, data points is, is decreasing in South Africa, um, what, what do you think the way forward is? Like, is there a way either to improve that, you know, us being not in the department, how could we facilitate that? Or, you know, living with the fact that we have so few data points or that it's declining, what are options to move around it? All right, we'll come back to that. I see Andrew Johnson has his hand up and Niku. Um, Andrew, you are more than welcome to unmute and ask your question. Thanks, Nicolette. Yeah, I think I think one of the, the things about all this information is where can we access this information? Where, you know, where is the central repository for this information? Because what we're trying to do and uh, with Rose University is set up a platform where there's a certain amount of monitoring that's done. It's going to be on the cloud and people can access this data. So we want to look at rainfall, um, soil moisture, um, water level responses to this. And I think this, if this data sits on the cloud, people can access it. And also I think the most important is that students can access it in order for them to be able to analyze the data for their thesis work. You know, so we'd like maybe some sort of crowdfunding to look at uh, at look at setting up a, a remote water, groundwater monitoring catchment where we could actually get this data to everybody for them to look at because it's all fine having this data, but if nobody's got access to it, you know, what do we do with it? Um, Andrew, thank you for that question. It's one of the things that um, I know is a bit of a problem. Most of the data that I worked with sits with the Department of Water and Sanitation, um, and they will make it freely available. But water level data, for example, you have to put in a request, um, except if it is on the NGA and you have registered there. But the NGA usually uh, only has a limited rec or um, edited, audited record of the whole data record that sits with the, on the Hydra database. Um, so that should be freely available, but there's a lot of data sitting with municipalities, with consultants, with um, even research institutions that's not necessarily freely available. And I know it's often a problem to get access to that data. So I, it is a good initiative to try and get the central uh, repository. I know um, Bertrand, Ernst Bertram, bef uh, before he um, retired and left the department due to health, 
um, kind of wanted to work on um, policy documents that um, would require all of the data to be um, submitted to the department. But at the current moment, with the lack of capacity, I'm not sure whether the department would be able to handle all of that just for the first thing. And then I know um, Emma Blesher and some of the people from the Table Mountain uh, partnership started working on a similar repository that you guys are talking about. So maybe we as a groundwater community need to look at ways that we can assist in getting something workable on the ground so that um, the data would be more accessible. But it's going to take some work to 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 get it all um, in, a, in a format that is available. Okay. Hope that answers your question. Good. Um, Niku, you also had your hand up if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, it's it's also related to the previous question. Uh, I just want to uh, commend the department for using a, a, a following an open data policy. So uh, because the data has been collected with the taxpayers' money, it's freely available to to academics, to consultants. So, so the data gets used quite extensively in, in various investigations for various purposes. In other countries, it's not the case. And, and it's really difficult and, and you have to pay for the data. And, you know, um, so the department is following the right policy. Um, uh, some of the water boards and so on, they their data you have to pay for because they uh, reckon it's, they, it's their data. They paid for their collection. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's probably less used. Just a word of caution when you create uh, new databases, please do not replicate the department's data uh, on your system. Rather, have a, an app or whatever you call them to go and collect the data from the department's databases rather, and, and not replicate it on your own database. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, Nico. It's appreciated. Yeah, I think the duplication is actually a valid point. Um, I was going to comment that the Water Research Commission, I think, is trying to fill this gap with a new repository or, or database that they have that is incorporating satellite data, which is actually very nice. But I actually can't for the life of me remember if they are duplicating the National Groundwater Archive or if it was like supplementary. Uh, Cindy, if you're still online, can I put you on the spot and ask you to provide more information? I know Cindy was working um, on that for her PhD. Um, I couldn't even remember the the name or the you? link. Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pretoria, and I'm part of the team working on the Water Research Observatory. Um, and yes, um, we are not duplic uh, duplicating any data. You can go online, you can access, uh, get the links to the National Groundwater Archive and things like that. But we're more focusing on, for example, validating the validation of using remote sense products using the data that is still available. Because we, as um, Nicolette mentioned, the distribution of water levels are scarce and getting less. But while we have it, if we can validate and identify where it is usable, how accurate it is, then um, yeah, we can use those resources where we don't have another way to go. But yeah. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Amy. Um, Angelo, I, I see you had your hand up, but now it's gone. Do you still have a question? Oh, yeah. Hi, hi Amy. Um, hey. I actually had a question, but then I think Cindy answered my question regarding the database. Because I was just concerned about the NGA, for instance. I don't know, Nicolette, if I'm at the, the department. Are you aware of how often the NGA dated with actual new data? Because in my time in consulting, we see that there's 100 boreholes in a two-kilometer radius site, and finding those boreholes at those specific locations or the coordinates is you, you just don't find the boreholes unless if you have a site representative who knows where a few boreholes are but 
in, in overall like coordinates for instance is always out with a kilometer or 10. A kilometer or 10. Oh, yeah. Nicolette, do you have a response? Um, I think I will um, try and do a bit of um, work uh, on a, a, a follow-up talk on, on the databases that I work on. But Angela, that is exactly one of the problems that I identified when I was still at the department. And if you start plotting them on, on Google Earth, you'll find that there's 20 borals plotting on about the same path. Um, and um, you go and look at the uh, geology, the one says it's got 20 meters sand and half a meter uh, away, there's one that's five meters sand and, and then it's directly into granite and it doesn't quite make sense. Um, so yes, um, th that problem that I described has to do with the fact that um, in the past they would take the farm where they did the drilling and they would plot all of the borals that they drilled in the middle of the uh, farm because it was too difficult to plot them um, on, on different places on the map. So that is the reason for that um, problem. The ones that um, Angela described where you have the coordinates, but you find it about 10 Ks uh, further, um, and I understand that's exaggeration, um, has to do with the fact that, um, first of all, there was no GPSs when most of these coordinates were taken. Second of all, the um, original data was in Cape Datum. It's now been uh, changed to WGS uh, 80, whatever. So the, the um, coordinate system changed. And in the conversion from the NGDB data to the NG8, um, to have it in the uh, more recent format, they actually um, may have made some errors on top of the original errors that was already there. Um, and then, of course, you get cases where the borals no longer exist. So you have coordinates and you go and find, uh, look for the boral and it doesn't exist anymore. One of the things I wanted to do when I was in the department was go and um, ground truth this data and um, they said, sorry, no budget. So it is something that may need to be addressed or um, we might just have to find a way to, to handle this. Yeah, that is quite a bummer because like it's, declining the number of points but also i think confidence is a big problem like a lot of people just don't use the nga database because there's so many conflicting you know locations of the boreholes and the, and the water level measurements you know with points that are close to each other so yeah that's a real problem matumbe um i see your hand is up you're more than welcome to ask your question i can't hear you i don't know if you maybe put your hand up by accident um Barnes? um <laughs> I, I mean, um, just to maybe to um, answer um, Angelo's question um, or to maybe add to that um, is that what's going to happen is that the, the, the department is busy with uh, groundwater regulations um, and that will probably be out for review by the beginning of next year. We hope to get it signed uh, around March next year. And what is it basically going to say is that... Um, we would like to require everybody to try uh, to start submitting their information. So that will definitely be um, adding new information to the NGA. Um, and then hopefully in the next five years or so, we would like to get the backlog um, of all groundwater use um, information also onto, uh, locked on, uh, or captured onto the NGA. Um, so in what, what it basically means is that you're not going to submit your information on a little form to the department and the department is going to capture it, but the, the water users are going to capture their own information. Um, so hopefully within the next year or so, we will get a lot of new information. Um, and then in the next five years, we will probably have a, a very good coverage. So, and we get definitely going to put that through to all the water use license holders to say that is part of your conditions when you've, you need to re you need to monitor according to your water use license and you need to submit that electronically or all to, onto the NGA. So that means you'll get almost like all the water use license holders monitoring data also captured on the NGA or ITRA. So within the next few years, we hope to, to cover that gap or close that gap and get a lot of new information. But yeah, let's watch this space. But um, 
it's it's out there to we identified that and we we're trying to to fill that gap. Yeah, thanks. That's great news. Awesome. I agree. Can, can I go? Can, can I go through uh, Emmy? Yes. Oh, sorry. So, uh, the thing is, uh, when I was uh, trying to unmute myself. Oh, uh, okay. Now we can my, hear you now. Uh, I can. I cannot find, I cannot find my, my 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 name. Oh, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot, uh, Fanas, for for clarifying that. Um, I just wanted to understand when you are um, somebody's working on the on an industry or you know mining industry, and then the department is, has got some strict rules in terms of the um uh, uh, to to actually give you the water use license. They've got a, some strict rules in their water qualities. Is there a way to reason out to the department uh, to sh so that they can actually relax the uh, the strict rules of the water quality? Matombe, I'm no longer with the department, so I cannot help you. But you need to uh, see if you can find an official at the department that's um, sympathetic to your problem and that would uh, be able to help you. Um, but you then have to provide them with proper um, arguments on why you want that um, uh, restrictions relaxed. Yeah, no, it's fine. But I, 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 I'm like, it, 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 it's very good that there, there are development people here uh, that are usually on the top. Mm. Thanks a lot, Nicolette. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I would like to reiterate that, Nicolette. Thank you. I think this is a really relevant topic, especially in South Africa. So it's good that we thinking about it and talking about it. And um, yeah, thrilled to know, Fanny, that you guys are working on it at the department. Um, great. Um, I think we've gone way over time. So if you have anything pressing, you feel free to contact Nicolette or myself and we'll, we'll, help, we'll help you. But I think with that, we're going to close. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you for participating. All right, okay, with that, we'll, we'll conclude. And again, yeah, thank you, Nicolette. And, um, all the best, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.